Good evening and welcome to this event. My name is Jerry Nasowska and I'm the chair of the British Association of Social Workers, which is the professional association for social work and social workers in the United Kingdom. And I'm here with uh, two guests virtually. So we are going to be having this conversation online and we'll hope there's no wobbles as we go along. But if there are, do bear with us. And I should also let you know that we are recording. So I'm here with Margaret Humphreys, who is a social worker and a true member of the global social work community. And last year, I'd hoped to meet you, Margaret, when you received the Andrew Moravia of Apostle Medal from the International Federation of Social Workers, which is the highest honor of the Federation. And you were nominated by BASWA alongside the Canadian and Australian associations because of your work to uncover the harm, the evil done to child migrants and to fight for their rights. And in the words of one child migrant, John Hennessy, you found their families, you brought them home one by one, you stayed beside them and you gave them a voice. And you received that medal in our 50th anniversary year and, and arguably the 50th anniversary of social work in England. And also 10 years since the story of what you uncovered, which you told in your book, Empty Cradles, was made into a film by our second guest, Jim Loach. And Origins and Sunshine was Jim's first feature film and was nominated for the Golden Mark Aurelia Award at the Rome Film Festival. And amongst other nominations, as I understand it, the film was nominated at the Australian Academy of Cinema for Best Film and Television Arts Awards and the Australian Film Critics Association Awards for Best Australian Film and picked up a succession of Best Actor Awards for Emily Watson and Best Supporting Actor Awards for Hugo Weaving and David Wenham. And in a short while, we will all have the chance to see that film, which is a wonderful, um, occasion for us and before that we will have a conversation um, where we're going to show the film from about quarter to nine sorry quarter to eight till 9 30 um, and then come back together to reflect on watching that um, and it's great to be joined for this conversation by many participants I can see um, Baswa members other social workers and um, family and friends no doubt as well so welcome to you all and you are invited to make a donation to the Child Migrants Trust, which you can do through the Basel website. And we also invite you to comment and use the chat box to let us know um, how, how you're doing and how you're feeling and what you're thinking as we go through the event. So we will shortly have a, a, com a good conversation, I hope. But before that, we thought it was really important to hear the voice of lived experience. So we're going to hear the testimony of a former child migrant, Marcel O'Brien, who, who you both know, um, given at the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. When you were about two years of age, you were placed with a foster mother in Lingfield in Surrey, is that right? Yes. And tell the chair and panel a little bit, please, about your recollections of that time. That I was in a loving and caring home there. Mum Chapman loved me. I, I didn't know my real mother. I was so young. And you all took me away from that. We'll hear evidence about the fact that you were migrated to Australia. Um, and we'll look at some documents in due course about that. But is there anything else that you want to say about that period of time with your foster mother? Well, I was re really well cared for and I'm still in touch with um, two of the foster children, Beryl and Ken, who mum, mum adopted Ken and his uh, sister. And Beryl I still see too. We will come to look at the documentation in relation to your migration. Um, in due course, but is this your understanding that papers were signed that authorised you to be migrated to Australia with the Fairbridge organisation? With the Fairbridge organisation, but I don't know about my mother signing anything. Well, we'll come and look at those documents um, in due course. Um, how old were you when you were migrated to Australia? Four. I turned five on the ship just before I reached Australia. And when you arrived at the Fairbridge Institution in Pinjara, is this right, that the way in which that institution was organised was by way of cottages? Yes. And that through your time in Pinjara, you stayed in three different cottages 
uh, Warren, Hastings, Wolf, and Shakespeare. Yes. And that those cottages had cottage mothers in charge of those cottages. Yes. And roughly how many children were in each cottage, to the best of your About recollection? About 12 in each cottage. Shakespeare was cottage mother was a bitch. Well, I'd like to ask you some questions about the cottage mother that you've described in those terms. Um, tell us, please, why you have described her in that way and about the way in which she behaved and treated you. She was mental cruelty, very mental cruelty and sadistic and physical. In terms of physical abuse, can you give us some more details about the way in which that occurred as far as your cottage mother is concerned? Got slapped around the head a lot, pushed in the back, put under a cold shower if they thought you weren't doing good, or locked in a cupboard with no lights or anything until they felt fit to let you out. Did she ever hit you with anything other than her hand? Ruler. Was a cane ever used by her? Not by her. But by other people? Yes. Would your cottage mother ever say things to you that were upsetting? <laughs> yeah. Can you're you... a bastard, you're a bitch, you're from the gutter, you're a nobody. You've got nobody. You've got no parents, they're all dead. Yeah. Would, she, would she say things like, nobody wants you? Yes. Were you ever called names by the cottage mother? <laughs> I was called Little Gutter Snipe or Platypus. Platypus because I had a big nose. And Little Gutter Snipe because when I first came out here, they had me in a wash trough scrubbing me with a scrub brush because they thought I was dirty. But I had a tanned skin. You said in your witness statement, I think, that... Um, you had a darker complexion to the other children, possibly because of your French father's Canadian, heritage. French Canadian, yes. Um, and that they tried to scrub you clean, is that, yes. is that right? Yes, And who was it who did that? That was one of the older children. I suppose she would have been commanded to do it. And who do you think commanded her to do that? The cottage mother. Is this right, that... Um, you didn't finish the third year of your secondary education? Yes. H help us with why you think that was. Because I was too dumb, they said. Couldn't. I was dumb. Uh, but I I'm not very good at, good at anything much now, but I had to leave school because I was dumb and couldn't keep do the work and went straight to work in the laundry room. And is that what you've been told? You're dumb, yeah. Yeah. And at what point did you go and work in the laundry at Fairbridge? What age were you? Well, when I left high school, I would have... Um, 13, 14, 14, 15, around that age bracket. You got homework, I think, from school, is that right? Well, we weren't allowed to do it. We tried to do it, weren't allowed to do it. So what happened if you were in the cottage and trying to do your homework? Well, we had a lot of work to do before we could do anything. Then by that time, it was bedtime. But if you try to do your homework, do you have memories of, of what I was I wasn't sent very you? good because I was dumb. Were things like, there's no point in doing your homework, just do your work, said yes. to you? Yes, yes. Was this the sort of thing that was said to you? You're nothing but a dumb gutter snipe trying to get above yourself? Yes. I think this is right, is it, that you left Fairbridge at 16 years of age? Yes. And you were sent to work yes. um, for a farming family near Bustleton in Western Australia? That was a bit later on, but I did go out to work and do domestic, yes. Yes. I had a few other, another job before that. I see. But when you got to the farm near Bustleton, you found the couple, lovely people, I think, is that right? They were a middle-aged couple and they had one boy up in boarding school and a little baby, which I was there to look after the baby. Did all the housework, cooking and everything like that. But I did have time to myself and I learnt to ride a horse. They were teaching me to drive a car 
and I really loved it there. It was really nice and they did give me a lot of time to myself. I think you said that for the first time in years you began to feel relaxed yes. and that life was not so bad. Yes. Uh, did that continue? No. Tell the chair and panel please why. They had some friends down the road that I used to go and play with their children and look after them until the husband started walking me back to the, to the, oh, I nearly said their name, to the farm and um, started molesting me all the time. And this was uh, a friend of the couple a that you lived with? A friend of the with. couple, young farmer, yeah. And you said that he touched you in a sexual way? Yes. Um, do you want to tell us anything further about that? Well, the last time he did have me on the ground but, and molesting and kept trying to get further, but I was able to free, got up and did go back to the farm. Didn't see them, didn't want to see them again after that. That's when I tried to leave. Did you write to the Fairbridge School and tell them what had happened? Yes. And what was the response you got? Just be a good girl and keep trying keep working. Did you end up in contact with the police as a result of your leaving the farm? I didn't, but they had the police on to me because I wanted to work down at Albany and stay there with my friends and they wouldn't let us, you had to go back. So when you say they, do you mean Fairbridge? Fairbridge made you go back, so they got a... Um, they sent the police Sent to... me back, that did, and put me on a truck. I was supposed to go on a train, but I didn't. I didn't want to go back, so I didn't go there until they got me again and put me on an aeroplane and brought me back to Perth. And when you got back to Perth, where did you? Where did they put you? Chucked when me in an institution. And this is the Mount Lawley Detention Centre, is yes. that right? Yes, and I did any, didn't do anything wrong. And I was there with criminals that were screaming and on, were really bad criminals and we were locked in big cages. And how, lo how long were you there for? I think it was nearly two weeks, I think. And is, is this right, that your understanding was that Fairbridge regarded you as under their control until you were 21? Yes. And that's why they had brought you back? Yes. Did you find it very frightening being in that detention centre? Terribly frightening. You don't know what you're doing. You've been there for you didn't do anything wrong. And all I think of was because he couldn't be bothered coming to get you from the airport. Turning now to the descriptions you've given in your statement of the impact these experiences have had on your life, and then I'll come back to look at some of the documents with you. Can you tell the chair and panel, please, what impact this has had on, on you and, and your emotional state since you left Fairbridge? I've been on, I've had manic depression and I've been on medication for years, years and years, the doctors put it on me uh, ages ago, um, had a mental breakdown. Um, like I said, I was pushed into marriage. I had four children, <coughs> but I didn't like the men touching me. So it never really worked out. We split. Um, he was it turned to be an alcoholic as well. And after that we split and I just haven't been able to let, just don't like men touching me. And is this right, that you were married at the age of 18, you yes. were pregnant by that age, yes. and your evidence is to this effect, that you were forced into a difficult and loveless marriage at the insistence of the deputy principal? Yes, just to get rid of you. You're off their hands then. And you've, you've put it in these words, having stuffed up my childhood, they then wrecked my early adult years. Yes. And is this right that in 2009 you applied to the Western Australia Redress Scheme about which we'll hear some more and that that was the first time you'd spoken in, in any detail about what happened? Yes. And the Child Migrants Trust helped you write a statement setting out the detail of your experiences? Yes, they've been marvellous. Wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. In 2000, when there was uh, the Australian Senate inquiry um, set up, is this right, that your daughter wrote a letter to the Senate uh, herself describing the impact uh, uh, that this has had on her? Yes. And we'll come to look at that letter. Yes. Is this right, that the Child Migrants Trust, as well as helping you set out your account, 
have helped reunite you with your members of your family? Yes, it was wonderful. Is this right that you've described finding your mother as being a dream come true? Yes, that's my mum. Very first time I saw her, I never knew her before. And how old was your mother when you first met her, to your recollection? Oh, 80 odd. And when you met her for the first time, did she say something like this, I know who you are, the bastards took you from me? Yes. And she said something like, there's not a day goes by that I don't think of you. Is that right? She always did, but didn't know where. And is this right, that as well as being reunited with your mother, the Child Migrants Trust has helped you locate your father's family in Canada? Yes, yes. And in time, the rest of your mother's family in England, and you now have a sister in London, some sisters in Montreal, and nephews and nieces all over? Yes. You yourself, I think, have now four children. Yes. 29 grandchildren. You can add to that, there's 43. (laughs) Gosh. (laughs) 11 of those are great-grandchildren. So I just want to acknowledge the the courage and dignity of Marcel O'Brien's testimony and and that this may bring up difficult emotions for some people who are, who are um, on the webinar and it's it is difficult to hear it. it's right that we should hear um, Marcel's voice first but Margaret I wanted to turn to you and you've talked you talked in your speech last year about the when you received the medal about the long road to social justice that you've been traveling and I wondered if you could just talk us through how you started out on that road we'll we'll see that depicted in oranges and sunshine soon but it would be really good to hear from you in your own words how this started how 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 it was you why it was you how it came about that it was you Margaret Humphreys who who took this road well, that's difficult <laughs> to answer why it was me. I don't know the answer to that. But I suppose in essence, for all of us as social workers, the importance of all of that is this was just one person that wrote a letter to me when I was a social worker uh, in a Nottingham City, very deprived area, dealing mainly with uh, child protection issues and we all know you know what that is like what hard work that is uh, within a local authority and you know I received this letter um, which basically said uh, you know I was born in Nottingham I was put on a boat and sent to the other side of the world with lots of other children and um, of course for me and my colleagues at that time all qualified social workers didn't know anything at all about boats leaving England with lots of children on going to the other side of the world. So it was, in a sense, exploring that one account. Um, as, and as I've said many, many times, that kind of lifted the lid on the lives of thousands and thousands of children and their mothers and fathers. So I guess uh, for us as professionals, the importance of listening and following through and searching for a truth is important everybody's truth is really important so you heard marcel yeah what can we say that that is the story of child migration she talks about her mother she had a mother she was there all the time yeah and that made the social workers today listening to this and participating in this that might tell a story for them about present day practices for children in care for example and we heard last week the new children's commissioner talking about young people being intense in listen hubs mm-hmm. yeah well, we need to listen and pay attention to those stories don't we we don't know where they're going to take us correct yeah um, the other thing that I really wanted to to talk to you about at the start, Margaret, is um, is about the impact. And you said just before we went live with the webinar that Marcel tells the story. It's it's her words that that really matter. Um, 
but through the Child Migrant Trust and through the uh, the work that you've done, you've heard so many stories. Can you tell us a little about the impact then and, and now as well, the ongoing impact that there is? Well, I think what we've learned um, through the child migrants and through their testimony and through their parents' testimony too, is the lifelong consequences of uh, a separation from family, of course, and as social workers are very mindful of, of that. But the sense of betrayal for this group of children and their families is profound. And one of the things, of course, that happens when you betray children, particularly, is that trust goes. There is no trust. And that's why it's called the Child Migrants Trust, because we learned very early on that trust would be the key, would absolutely be the key to building relationships, to help people have a sense of identity, to restore some dignity, and to more than anything, to let them know that they're important to us, that we're part of them and they're part of us. So the bigger picture of humanity. Um, so consequences, mm -hmm. lifelong. Can you recover? Yes, partially. That's what they tell us. That's what we see, of course. But to deliver justice, to deliver truth, but more importantly, or as importantly, is to hear the truth and listen to it. So your question is, what is the consequences? Well, I'm sad to say lifelong. I expect that we would expect that and anticipate it. But is there a sense of recovery that we have seen? Oh, yes. So is there hope? Oh, yes. And um, we need to talk to Gordon Brown about that when he delivered the nation's apology. Mm. Um, you know, can we say sorry? And it means something. Does it mean something? Well, it means something when you've been sent away. It means something when you've been believed. And it means something when the Prime Minister of the day says to you, you will never be forgotten again. And you may call this child migration, but to me, he said it looks more like deportation. And that was so um, uplifting uh, to this group of people to hear someone say, at last, us at last someone believes us and someone wants us to come home and they will help us do that yeah. and that is still something that we social workers need to remember every day that you need to not just listen but believe people and the well, yes, and that makes. Have, a, have a confidence i think that, that as a profession we need to have a confidence that we can change things we can and we must and we should we should have a voice too. Well, somebody has just put into the chat that um, they met you when they were a student around 15 years ago and talked to you and that convinced them that they'd chosen the right profession. So that sense of hope must have been conveyed, I think. Um, well, that's nice to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I did want to um, also ask you about how how this is possible um how this was possible we're talking about the experiences of over a hundred thousand children um and the impact and the kind of echoes the ripples from that across so many lives it, it's it's difficult to understand but important to understand how it is possible um and I, i'm really interested in your opinion about the role of different institutions um in that you know Bearing in mind that many social workers you know, still work for local national government. Well, they must answer some of that, mustn't they, for their past practices. I mean, looking, looking at the past is never easy. It's painful. Um, I think that that's been hard, that's been tough to do that. Um, in the early days, the uh, I will call them the employers, would say to me that um, that, that was the standards of the day. Mm. Well, when was it the standards of the day to abuse children? 
So all sorts of explanations around the time of of the exposure of this were given. You know, this was uh, the standards of the day. We were doing thought we were doing the right thing. Well, that really wasn't the conversation that one wanted to have. Really, the conversation what we wanted we were looking for is what do we do now? Do we need to do it quickly? What is the need out there? And those were the questions that were never asked by anybody in those early days. So the decision of the trust around that time, just a few of us, was to do we give our time and energies to that debate? Mm -hmm. To helping people realize that there is a past, that this past was awful, terrible, and here's the consequences. And we decided no, not at that time, because at that time there was so much hope People have mothers, fathers alive, and every day, every day mattered, every day counted. So we decided, a conscious decision, get on with the work. Just get on with it. And of course, at that point, we were finding families all the time for people who'd been told their families were dead, that they were orphans. So for us, looking at this, every day was a revelation yeah so difficult times most certainly and looking back now and look back now i think wow how yeah. naive how naive we were because as you described it in your introduction evil and of course you can't comprehend that you're suspended in this position where you cannot comprehend the enormity of it and, and the enormity of it um, unraveled slowly, very slowly indeed. Yeah, and I, for our heritage year, the 50th anniversary, the, the theme that we have is looking back and looking forward because of that recognition that unless we do look properly at the past and, and take on board what's happened, we won't carry with us a sense of um, grounded hope you know that things can be different because it will be it won't have that awareness of how things can go wrong yes i'd like to to talk a bit about the film oranges and sunshine now if i may and the first thing i wanted to say is it was wonderful seeing a social worker on screen and there were some things that really resonated with me around um the satchel, the carrying of the jacket, you know, the real, it really felt like we were, we were seeing our, our own profession. And I think for many people who were joining us, it, it's a rarity to see, to see a social worker on screen. Um, and I just wanted to, to, to ask you both, Margaret and Jim, what, what was it like trying to bring a social work story to life? Um, How did that feel? Um, well, I guess uh, for me, there were, <laughs> I'll probably let Jim speak about that more than me, um, but uh, there were all sorts of issues and worries about confidentiality, and all those areas that social workers are, are familiar with. And, um, yeah. Mm. It's a big step, a necessary one. Yeah, and of course it was your first first film, Jim, as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, yes, I'm struggling quite with my internet connection. So, apologies if I'm looking at. Uh, but can you hear okay? Not quite. We knew that this would happen at some point. Um, so, can you hear me okay? That sounds a bit better. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'll struggle. Oh, yikes! Sorry. Um, and now, okay. I'll just mm -hmm. do voice. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, um, um, 
well, I, I read something in a newspaper in The Guardian. I was working over in Manchester and, um, and, and doing a, a, a TV show. And I just read a very small piece. And I was a young and, um, <laughs> young and uh, inexperienced and bold. So I, I think I phoned Margaret up. I, I can remember the conversation quite well. And I was immensely intimidated, and um, to be honest with you, and uh, and but I think it struck a chord immediately. What I'd read, it it it, it because it it seemed something so extraordinary. A extraordinary. I I I hadn't heard about it in my ignorance, um, and it seemed extraordinary. And and there was something so primal about it aside from primal in the sense of just um, maternal, paternal loss and a child being separated from their parent is, is such an extraordinary e emotional connection mm. to something. And that spoke to me straight away. And then also, of course, it's, it's social and political and it connects with the empire and, and, and it, it, it um, I sort of um, it approached it like a sort of miscarriage of justice sort of story, really. And that's the way it presented to me straight away. And um, I was sort of determined to try and try and make it into a film. And, and the fact that it, it had Margaret in the, in the sort of uncovering it, of course, is an important factor, too, because it, that gives you a way in. It feels after hearing that testimony and, and listening to Margaret, I have to say talking about filmmaking somehow seems very coarse by comparison, to be honest with you, because of the power of what we've just heard. But in the sense of trying to, to represent a story on screen, those elements are of course really important. So those those are the things that drew me to the story at the beginning. Yes. And it's it's a story as as we've said, it encompasses a hundred thousand and more lives uh, but it unfolds in the film through some particular stories of particular children um, uh, mm. as adults then who we really get to know and feel connected to so mm. as a director how did you go about telling those particular stories well um we um rona munro who wrote the script we um of course we met margaret a few times um and then uh, we went to australia and margaret introduced us to some extraordinary people and um that was completely life-changing like on a personal level never mind the film um and very gently over a period of of you know quite some time really i mean in an initial period of a couple of weeks we went to uh, perth but then some time after that via emails and messages and phone calls, um, former child migrants shared some of their stories. And that was an ex sort of extraordinary experience really. Um, and it, every day was a sort of revelation to us really because, um, because of course it challenged all your perceptions because in a way you expected to to meet people who were sort of broken in a way and and were, were not able to were were overawed by what had happened to them and mm -hmm. of course they they carried ex terrible damage but they also had um, dignity and humor and a lot of humor i mean we laughed so much i mean <laughs> you know and and strength and a huge amount of solidarity with each other um and um they were tremendous fun to be around you know so it challenged a lot of all of our preconceptions in a way mm -hmm. i think and and then very quickly sort of um characters sort of solidified around and informed by everybody we've met and it it does always sound like that's something you just say but i have to say honestly honestly is true that every single person we met impacted the story we told mm -hmm. um in a profound tangible way because they would say something or they'd do something or they'd carry themselves in a certain way or um so um so the the characters in the film were not really any one person as such but they were more 
um, then there would be someone in mind, but then there'd be bits of other people and and bits of everybody we met. That's the that's the only way I can describe it, really. Yes, and that um, you've said it was an unforgettable experience and changed the lives mm. of of everyone who made the film. Um, mm. Have you have you kept in contact with people? Are you still? Um, does that still stay with you? That experience? Yeah, it really does. Actually, yeah, it really does. Um, it, it it completely. I mean, um, obviously, people that we made the film with. I made the film with. You know, we we talk all the time because we work regularly together. Mm -hmm. Margaret and I are in touch all the time, and and. Um, it 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 changes you, I think, because I think um, you were at once struck with what a tremendous res responsibility um, the cards dealt you to make the film, you know, and what a um, and it, like an, a real honour it was, to be honest with you, and um, and that was that was scary uh, you know and 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 also testing because obviously you you're also have a responsibility to make, to make a film that is going to connect with an audience and find an audience and people are going to respond to who don't have your emotional personal connections you know they're just going to turn up in a cinema and watch a film and they so that there can be a tension there as well and um but uh, it, you know, I mean, it was it was interesting to us making the film because, obviously, in a way, I don't want to spoil the ending for people who haven't seen it. But you know, there was initially there was some um, expectation that we would have a sort of climactic scene at the end when um, everyone, you know, there's a courtroom and everybody, you know, the the guilty are. You know, uh, I found uh, sent down, and uh, the truth comes tumbling out, and the the victims and adversity commas are, you know, completely um, proven correct, and all of that stuff. Mm. And um, we said, oh, we don't want to do any of that um, because it's not true, and it will completely sell this story short because it's just a live, ongoing thing, um, and we can't just sort of make up a sort of Hollywood ending. And obviously, mm -hmm. there was absolute horror <laughs> by, by some. And um, and it, we we were driving towards something more subtle, really. Mm -hmm. And because something that would speak to everybody, so that people would really connect with it in a very real way, if that makes sense to you. And um, mm -hmm. and we so we couldn't really sell it short by having a um, a punch the air moment at the end. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, Margaret, that that chimes with the 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 poster that you you have behind you there that says we are still waiting for justice. Um, would you say a little bit about the current work of the Child Migrants Trust and how that how that journey is now? Um, well, of course, uh, a lot of our work is about loss grief and mourning and we've already touched on that but the important legacy issues of uh, their testimony is so important to the world today for us to hear that and listen to it so part of our just part of our work at the moment is uh, listening and taking a filmed testimony of those people who really want to leave their experience to the world, to give it to us. What a gift to give us of their life, of their experience, and how they see it now, as many are coming towards the end of their life. So that's a huge uh, piece of our work at the moment because there's not a lot of time left. I mean, the story of child migrants, the story of the trust working with and for child migrants has always been against the clock always. So that's part of our work, uh, the, the justice aspect of our work, the campaign is still on, ongoing, um, most certainly. And of course the core work, the core work is around justice, around um, 
uh, well, as you can see, we many, many inquiries and mm. the Royal Commission in Australia and ICSA here in the United Kingdom that we're waiting for ICSA to report next year. So social justice, um, still the core work around reuniting families. And, and that, that is, a, you know, takes a long time to build trust in families and a lot of nurturing and a lot of support. So we haven't completed fully our core work. Mm -hmm. And then of course, at the moment, um, it's around uh, testimony for, for redress, for justice, for really looking closely at what's happened to people on many dimensions. So at the moment, sexual abuse of children is where inquiries are focusing and we all know and appreciate that and appreciate why but for the child migrant community as well there are other issues that haven't been dealt with and that is identity look what you did you stole my identity and this now impacts on my children on the next generation who don't know who grandma is who don't know who auntie is and don't understand my mother or my father, how they've been as parents and how can we come together as a family and understand this loss, really understand it. So it's generational, it's international and it still waits for justice. Yeah, and I think it will touch on social workers' current practice, won't it, the people that we may meet, um, whether they are people who've experienced um, abuses themselves or are related to that or the next generation, those stories kind of echo on down, don't they? So, Yes, they do. It becomes part of what happens to a family. There were a few people um, writing into the, the chat um, about their their respectful and gratitude for Marcel O'Brien's testimony and I wondered if you were able to say a little about the support that she had to 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 take that step which must have been a huge one to to go to the independent inquiry. I think it was for everybody that came particularly Marcel of course as we saw it took great strength to be able to come home and give evidence to her country, to her people and to her family. So yes, and for others um, that gave evidence to ICSA, for many it was, I never, and they've said this quite often, I never thought this day would come, ever. As children, we used to say to each other, I hope one day somebody finds us. I hope one day somebody finds us. So for them, that was their unbelievable moment that was tinged yet again with fear and apprehension. But uh, an inner strength, as Jim spoke about, a resilience that said, I have to tell you, you have to know, you have to face your past. And you can only do that if I tell you. Yes. Um, I wanted to, to turn back to the film for a moment and think about um, how, how, what, what's, what really stands out. Um, we're going to be watching it shortly. Um, I've met, um, for me, one of the things that, that particularly strikes me is the music, um, both the music by Lisa Gerrard, but also the there's a use of a pop song at a particular moment. Again, I don't want to plot spoil, but it is, it's a moment that really, really struck me and resonated with me. And I just wanted to ask you, Jim, what, um, what you took most from the film and, and what you would want people to notice as they watch. Um, thank you, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, um, I suppose empathise with the people on the screen really is the, is the is the most honest answer really you know 
Um, I mean, as Margaret was saying at the beginning, you know, the the interesting thing is that it it it, it echoes on. You know, I mean, you know, we all watched in horror the kind of family separation policy on the southern border in the U.S. and last year. And I was reading the paper um, that there's still six, more than 600 children who haven't found their parents from that appalling policy. And and then who can forget the hostile environment? You know that that we had here. And so it sort of it echoes on through the through the through the decades, you know, and, um, um, but I, you know, identifying with the people on screen is, it, is the most fundamental thing for me in the film. I mean, it was interesting when we were promoting it, um, we went to, when it opened in, it, you know, there were some territories where I opened and I thought, I just can't see how this film's going to connect here at all. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to come. And um, and and I remember um, in Tokyo at the, the first night, and I, I was just feeling a bit anxious to be honest that I'd be there on my own in the cinema. And but people really came and found a way to connect with it, and 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 they had their own example of of a social policy, you know, that may have happened in Japan. Um, and it was, of course, its own, you know, it's its own thing. But nevertheless, they found a way to connect mm -hmm. to it. And that was the most extraordinary thing for me in making the film, was that people wanted to connect to, 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 to the people on screen and, and, and identify with them and, and empathise with them. Um, and so that, that, that's what it means to me. Mm -hmm. And how about for you, Margaret? I think the film tells a story and it tries to tell it as profoundly and truthfully as it is. Now I can recognise the characters, you know, absolutely. And, and I think just as importantly, it's important, you know, to say this to Jim too, that the child migrant community as a whole recognise bits of themselves in all of it. So it could be anybody mm. in that community. And they were supportive uh, of the film. Most mm. absolutely. And as Jim says, to, you know, such humour and uh, such regard and respect for Jim, um, uh, because he'd listened, he'd heard, and as Jim said, you know, it touched him. It touches all of us. It changes all of us. Um, mm. And I think the film conveyed that. You know, we all live with loss in our life to some extent, and grief is universal. Mm. So it was a film for everybody, for absolutely everybody. Mm. Thanks, Margaret. No, that that that's really nice of you to say, and that, that is you, you're that's something very important to say, as just as you said, actually, that the former child migrants themselves were unbelievably supportive. I mean, incredible. Absolutely incredible. I mean, we, we had a, a, a meeting after when we first showed the film and I remember somebody saying, we've got your back. And um, <laughs> when they come for you and I just thought, oh my God, that, that just meant so much to me. And uh, also the, the British Association of Social Workers were fantastic when, we, when this film was first released. Um, and are, are tonight, I mean, in, incredibly supportive. So thank you to, to you and to all of you. I mean, that, that um, was incredibly important and um yeah. so we're very grateful for it you're, you're very welcome i mean i think it's come up in the in the chat quite a lot how rarely um stories of these kind are told and how invisible often the struggles are that people face mm -hmm. when they experience loss or separation or um or are powerless before things that happen to them uh, so mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. storytellers who will who will tell those stories is really important thank you um, you when you kind of joined the call just before everyone else came in um it was really lovely to see the connection between you both yes. um and you've spoken about the the experience of um of working on the film as being one that sounds like family almost um that real kind of sense of 
of togetherness and and even fun um, I just wondered if you could say a bit more about about that and the experience of kind of moving between what looks like a permanently grey Nottingham and a very very bright Australia how how did that work how, yeah. how did that unfold um well we started in 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 Nottingham and um we'd <laughs> I mean, we'd got a slightly naive idea that we didn't want to do the obvious thing of it raining in England and, and um, sunny in Australia because that would be just so bloody obvious. And, um, <laughs> but then when we were shooting in Nottingham, we pitched down, <laughs> it rained the whole time, so, or a lot of the time. Um, um, you know, um, yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> we wanted to we didn't want to end up with this sort of a, um, a very sort of peripatetic kind of film that felt very sort of split, you know, but, but the important thing was that the character of Margaret took you through the story and, and we, we followed the story and looked at, looked at every situation through her eyes. She was sort of the, the audience in the film. That was the way we wanted to approach it. So, we 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 wanted to sort of just be on Emily's shoulder the whole time. I mean, sometimes she would be like she. I mean, she'd still text me now about it. You shot the whole film on my back, and um, <laughs> and and it was it was it was partly that it was it was experiencing the story through her eyes, and she was our Margaret. And it obviously, you know, I mean, it, it's a version of Margaret. Of you know, what I mean, it's not the real. And Margaret and I have spoken a lot about this. It's not the real person. It's like a screen version of Margaret. But that was the idea for the film, really, was to to see it through her eyes, and um, and and to to go on the journey with her, really. Um, I think that does really resonate with us social workers because Margaret in the film spends so much time watching mm. and listening and not, mm. not moving and not speaking and in a way like holding things and that is very often our experience isn't it Margaret as social workers that we are present and have to be present somehow yes I used to wonder how that would um, how Jim would manage that um, because you say lots of our time is listening and, and being perfectly still and uh, not a lot of animation and I used to kind of worry about that in the early days of working with Jim, that how would you convey a, a social worker on screen? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, in, it's really, it's interesting. It, it kind of, I mean, it, but they say that acting is, is a majority listening. It's just, um, but it, I, I know exactly what you mean, because in a way, Emily was very good at that, I have to say, like she, she, she you know i mean it, it's as i say it's it's a curious thing because it, of course it's uh, pulling in opposite directions because the film's meant to have a star and the star is meant to be all about the star you know i mean that's I, filmmaking is feels very crude in this <laughs> in this elevated company but that's kind of the way films work so it's very counterintuitive to to somehow pivot a film around its lead lead actor but nevertheless shine the light on the people she was meeting that was sort of a challenge really um um yeah that was the challenge yeah and i think that does so as, as i watched it sort of think, trying to think of, of watching it kind of as as a social worker i i did get that sense of getting to know people by being still and being present mm. and um and there's not that kind of here's this character and this is what they're like you you find out if you wait mm. yeah yeah people because people give themselves people you see it in, in details i think in people don't you you know in the small moments and um that's what we really wanted to try and do was not to to just let people speak in their own voice in the film, but um, let it come out in the small details as well, in who they are and how they carried themselves and so on. So that you don't feel you have to 
have that in totality of someone's experience in one scene because that would be simplistic and selling people short you just you're just trying to get a window really into someone else what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes i think i think that does bring us back a little to the the word that we were talking about um a little while ago margaret which was trust which is the the name of the of the trust but also the foundation stone of the work that you do and it's something that all we all need to have in our personal lives but social workers need to have it in our professional lives too to a great extent and i wondered if you could say a little about about that about trust about how you create trust how you sustain trust hmm. oh by delivering by doing by delivering that's how i see it in a sense so pe working with people who have no reason to trust anybody at all um how do you do that you can't just be a sympathetic pathetic listener that's part of it but uh, a small part in a sense how do you gain trust well by respect first of all and then delivering absolutely helping people understand that um if you make a commitment to take this journey with somebody and neither of you know where it's going to end i don't know if we're going to find a family if we're going to find a mother or father alive or if they've uh, are no longer alive i don't know that either so that's great equality at that point i don't know any more than anybody else but what i do know is for myself is that i will go and my colleagues do as well the extra mile all the time so i think about trust trust is something that in this particular context is is about doing, is about believing, is about delivering, if that makes sense. It really does. It really does. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And and you've talked about the time issue with that, that it time is against you. Um that I think that comes across very clearly in the film um as well, that sense of urgency and also that it takes time. So how how do you manage that? urgency and need to to be patient well i, I guess um in terms of urgency everything that the trust does is specialized this is a highly specialized project so that specialism and that independence that you have enables you to know where you've got to move quickly and what the risks are to an individual or to a family in not doing that so yes on all on all aspects time is running out and time has always been that big factor that we don't have we don't have the luxury of that there's been a really um powerful conversation in the chat that I want us to um, to come to if, if we can and, and it relates actually back to a phrase that you used Jim which was about this being a primal story in terms of the separation loss family those being really um, really powerful things and there's another really kind of primal story which is the one about justice and injustice and righting wrongs and there's been a conversation going on in the chat about the wrongs of today um what mm. what would it be that we would look back on um or maybe that we're start slightly aware of now or uncomfortable with that we really need to to be challenging and and so i, I wanted to to ask you margaret initially what what you think the responsibility of social workers today is and, and what was what should baswa be doing as well it's a big question of course could you repeat it? I'm afraid mm. I just just froze at that point, so I didn't hear the question. Yeah, I, what I was asking about what the responsibility is now for social workers. Um, what what's our role now in 
in combating injustice and righting okay. wrongs and and what should be the role of the professional association of Basra as well well it's a good question I, I was thinking today what is the equivalent today you know if we were to you know, 30 years look back at today what would be the equivalent of child migration what would it be and I think there are lots of things around but your central question is for social work and um, I think that we need in a much stronger value base. I think we need to be stronger and more purposeful on social justice, injustice. I really feel very strongly about that. And I think that I meet social workers quite a lot and I think they are often, often, there's quite a weakness there in the training. I do think that. And so I think we need a much stronger value base, we need a stronger ethical base, and we need to be more cognizant of human rights. Um, and I think that's a challenge uh, among many challenges. They are, that is the fundamental challenge of social work in, today, in today's society. And there's no shortage, is there, at the moment of injustice. And one only has to look at oh, Windrush, for example. And there are many, many others um, at the moment, too, where we can see echoes of the past. And as Jim has referred to that too, and I've spoken about the new children's uh, uh, officer in terms of looking at younger children today and the plight of children in care and leaving care. So there's no shortage of things that social workers really need to um, up the stakes on these issues of injustice. Uh, absolutely, I think we're an amazing profession in many sense. You'll, you'll hear me say, you'll find us everywhere. We are everywhere where there's pain, where there's suffering, where there's loss, where there's injustice. But you don't always see us and you don't always hear us. But we're there. Yes, and there was there was actually there's a follow up question in, in the chat, which is for all of us, in fact. Um, but I wondered if you could start us thinking about it, Margaret, which is how do you challenge the whole system in the way that you did? I think any, any individual social worker can sometimes feel that it's so huge. So how, where do you start? How do you, how do you challenge a whole system? <laughs> well, I don't think we've quite done that yet. <laughs> but, uh, um, how do you do it? Yeah. Well, there's a simple way, isn't there? explaining it it's very difficult it takes a long time and uh, it takes stamina and commitment and uh, good people around you as well you don't do these things on your own it's people around you and um, and you have to stay with it and you have to have resilience I think there's always that saying isn't there around child migrants remind me of it very often and um, speak truth to power and don't stop doing it. That's actually really helpful in thinking about what the professional association's role should be as well. All those things that you've just talked about, um, sustaining people, keeping the commitment, supporting people, staying with it. It's much more possible to do that collaboratively, isn't it? To, to have to come together to do that. And I, yeah. I do see that there's so much more that we could do collectively. And, and Jim, I guess it would be it would be really good to hear from you about what you think the role of, of film might be in those kind of um, challenges of, of injustice. Um, and this, you know, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, as a director, what 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 do you see your your part in this? Because clearly, it has a profound impact um, to to tell those stories. Yeah. Well, I mean. Mar Margaret's answer just now was so brilliant, I have to say, <laughs> and uh, you know it sort of almost can't it can't be bettered at, at all. But um, I mean, the thing about films is is it, it can it can point a big finger at something, you know, even if it even if it just says, "Look at this, this is a big big problem," you know, um, even if it just does that and it causes a noise. And it it, it it causes people to 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 look for a moment. 
then it has a sort of a, a function and it can't you know films can't change anything you know they they can't they can't of course they can't um change anything but they 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 can shine a light obviously and you know and and to that end that you know i i think that's the that's the crucial role of 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 arts of films theater music whatever it is and and to also to express express it in 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 different ways because like one of the things we with with this story is you know and, and margaret and i used to talk about it a lot was you could make 10 films 10 films you know it wouldn't we could do a sequel to oranges i mean we we're joking about that all the time aren't we margaret you know you, yeah. you could do you could do you could do what has happened in the last couple of years there's lots of different angles and there's lots of different ways of expressing it um and you know and and this film was just one way it was just one way of seeing it um mm. and I think that's 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 what we need to do, really. I mean, I, those are the stories I I, I I I love to be involved in because they they I mean, it really truly is the front line social work, the front line on on the sort of human condition. I mean, it's sort of an extraordinary extraordinary line of work. Um, so. Um, that's a much less good answer than the one one market just gave. But I think I think it's, a, it's an important be. answer. I think films can make things visible, and one of the things we talk a lot about in social work is is how invisible it can be, mm. um, and and that you're often working with people whose whose lives are, are hidden. Mm. So bringing that into the light, um, giving people the chance to to have a yeah. voice. Is yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's a, it's a curious thing in this country how you know that the, the proved to be the more challenging films to make. You know, we're very good at the, the royals get to make you know have their stories told over and over on television, and and um, the great and the good, uh, you know, the political class get their stories told all over the place. You know, and um, um, it, it's we need to get better at telling other people's experiences too you know yeah. and um that's something i really really believe i just wanted to share something else with you margaret from the chat from someone else who um who worked with you they say about 35 years ago when they were a very new social worker i think of her often and would like to think i've hung on to the fire in my belly for powerful social work which she helped to light all those years ago oh thank you Thank you so much for that. I think it's really wonderful as well to think about the kind of impact that social workers can have, maybe without realising it at times. Um, you maybe didn't realise that you'd had that impact on that person. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we do have the chance uh, to to be around people and to, to, to meet people in ways that, that can be very profound. Mm. So we're we're getting to the point where we're going to screen the film, um, and um, I just just wanted to share one more comment before we go to the film, which is um, somebody saying that um, they're a current social work student, and listening tonight reminds me of how wonderful and inspiring Margaret's work has been, um, but also that I need to fight to protect the stories and truths of service users that we have the privilege of working with. So someone at the very start of their social work journey. Mm. So, if, yeah. And I'm going to find a better internet connection somewhere in my house. It would be lovely to be day. able to see you as well. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're going to turn to the film in a moment and it takes around an hour and 45 minutes. So we hope that people will, um, will, will keep um, sharing their thoughts as we go along in the in the chat um, and um, let us know how the film is resonating with you and then it will be shortly before half past nine we'll come back together to share a few reflections about watching the film um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it again having had the chance to think differently about it from talking to you both Margaret and Jim so thank you so much for that and we'll see you in a little while.
Hello, everyone. Good evening again. I'm just allowing a moment for the for the film to to settle and resonate with people. If you do want to share things in the in the chat, please do. Um, as you can see, Margaret is coming back, and I'm hoping that Jim's connection will also allow him to come back in as well. Hello, Margaret. Hello, Jim. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. I hadn't seen the end of the film for quite a while, actually. So it was quite nice to, to, to watch it with everybody. Yes, yes, it, uh, there's been so much um, coming through from people about the way in which this film has um, has struck them. And I just wanted to start off with um, a reflection of my own. I'll bring in some thoughts from the, from the chat as well, um, which is the thing that really struck me watching it this time was was the theme of truth through the film um, in the midst of efforts as we go along to silence or to blame or to misdirect or to deny and social worker acting as a, as a witness to the truth and as a disturber of the lies. And that really echoed with things that people were saying in, in the chat about the crucial role of telling people's stories and of as truth as a way of setting people free. So someone wrote that once experience is revealed, the force behind bad acts loses its grip. And I wondered if that was something that you could maybe talk about a little as, as people exposed the lie of Margaret and wrote the book and Jim, then you came and brought that truth to, to the screen. Yes, yeah, you, you go first, Margaret. <laughs> yes, I, well, I, I can go back really to Jim and the film, and I think that was at the heart of it, really, that it told a truth. And it told a truth that reached all of us in some way or another. Um, but telling the truth, of course, isn't always easy. It can be, and often is, very painful painful for the person who's sharing that truth with you and watching intently the impact it's having on you as well and um and hearing so there's a telling of the truth and there's a hearing of the truth and both of those things have responsibilities around them and then we have responsibilities towards each other the moment that truth is shared, you cannot unshare it. Mm. So it's very risky for the person who's going to convey something. And for most people um, within this context, the truth is something that's held them together. It's something like, if I give this to you, will I lose myself, a bit of myself that holds me together, whether that be anger, um, a whole range of emotions. So it's risky. It's very risky to tell the truth in that context. And as Jim knows, and I know, and I would imagine many people listening to this know as well, it's very risky to hear it. Yeah. And we heard Jim say how it had changed him and uh, most certainly has uh, me and the people around me and how how could it not if you're prepared to hear it mm. yeah. yeah yeah that's so interesting what you just said margaret and <clears throat> you know and and we were when we were making the film we were struck by how often so many people these people have been disbelieved or not not just not been allowed to tell their story in their own way and um and that was something we were really determined to do was to to allow that to be said you know and and <clears throat> and it, it i i think um it's a personal truth but it was it's an objective truth as well like a shocking truth that has to be said and confronted so it was sort of a double whammy, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't just a, 
it wasn't just a, a personal experience on a, um, a wider story. I mean, this is what happened to these people. So there was a lot of anger as well in yeah. wanting to make the film and, 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 and say it like really clearly, you know? Um, I mean, it was an interesting one because we thought for a long time about, I mean, making this film, it actually just watching the end there really brought back to me the, the whole challenge of based on a true story mm. and kind of really what does that mean based on a true story? And um, because who's truth and you're making a film that lasts an hour and 40 minutes and that was how many years of Margaret's life? I mean, six, seven, eight, I would think easily of, of, of eight years compressed into an hour and 40 minutes. So it's pretty, it really makes you confront what is truth, you know, what are we trying to say? And um, I went Rona Munro, who wrote the script, her sort of driving principle there was the truth we need to convey is the kind of emotional truth. The, the, the emotional core, try to, to transmit the emotional core of what happened to these people. That's like the fundamental thing that we have to, to deliver mm -hmm. on screen. And, um, and uh, so it was, a, it was a real lesson to me in a way because I was kind of younger and early in my career and they're kind of big things to kind of confront you know and 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 big responsibilities too um so it's it's interesting watching you know thinking about it now a decade later you know mm. um but yeah and that certainly seems to have have been what's what's what people's experience has been because the um the comments have been about the the resonance of what you've said with people's own personal experience, but also professional experiences as social workers, you know, the, the emotional um, truth of it has definitely come, come across to people um, and, and resonated with their own experiences. Um, and also with the experience of being the social worker as a, as a witness. So there's been some, um, some real kind of discussion around the, the perseverance and the potential of being overwhelmed that, that Margaret in the film experienced that you must have experienced in, in your life, Margaret, um, and comments like it's humbling that you never gave up and your commitment um, is a testament to love. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Margaret, if you have any kind of advice to social workers with people listening um, who, who are just at the start of their career, people who have been in social work for, for decades, how, how do people keep going how do we what sustains us what sustains you well I don't know if it's because you step um, start off with a set of values or if those values develop in the face of such horror so I don't really know I've never really worked that out I'd like to think that I've started off with some strong values and that I processed it through that but I think probably the reality was um, that I didn't really have those values as strongly as I thought um, and that this experience uh, changed me in lots of ways and in some ways made me a softer mm. person and people often see me as a much harsher person if you like with some clarity around things. Um, I don't think that's uh, quite the case so mm -hmm. often I'm asked um, was there a point at which you thought I can't do this or I'll get another job or this is too hard and I can really say you know I've really looked at that and particularly when I was working with Jim he, he would put lots of things to me or they would just appear and questions would follow and I'd be, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> or I don't I know the answer um, because I never ever thought for one moment there was a choice. Mm. So I never had those discussions with myself or with my family or with anybody. And I feel astounded when people would ask me and I never had an answer to it. And the answer is, I never thought there was a choice. Mm. So I suppose the question about social work is 
always an ongoing question is this a vocation what is it um and i think you soon find out and you find out um, and as jim said you find out also a lot about yourself as well yeah mm. yeah mm. and i guess yeah. you find out about yourself making a film as well <laughs> yeah well, you do you do mm. yeah yeah, yeah. Well, i mean i think it 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 it, um, it 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 provoked sort of um very strong feelings of you know because you want to fix it mm. do you know what i mean on a and and you can't and that's that's the interesting thing that sort of i realized a couple of years later after making the film was you kind of you have a sort of subconscious thing going on and not not I mean, it probably sounds a bit grand. I, I don't mean it at all in a grand way, but a sort of a subconscious sort of motor that you want to kind of yeah. make it right. And obviously you can't, you can't make it right at all. Those, you know, and, and so, yeah, it's challenging, really challenging. I, I remember asking Margaret those, all those bloody awkward questions, you know, like when, and it's because you kind of in, in, the, in a making a film, of course, you're used to, it's interesting how approaching this subject it didn't it didn't conform to a classic dramatic narrative because like normally you would have a moment where mm. the hero they call it the no turning back moment you know they're in up to their neck and they they want to <laughs> give up but they realize they can't and <clears throat> but those it, it didn't conform to that kind of stereotype in a way which was good i'm glad it didn't it, you know but that was behind probably awkward irritating and awkward questions to margaret from me <laughs> and it is open isn't it and still the story is still alive so people were asking about you know what has happened to the the perpetrators what's happened to the abusers what's happened to these places what 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 now and i think mm -hmm. that ongoing questioning um that's really important as well as part of the because there isn't a neat ending to any of this mm. yes yeah 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 no I, I i think that's really true there's no there is there's no sort of hollywood ending but but you know but but nevertheless we didn't want to end on a total downer i mean there are the huge achievements that margaret and the trust have I, I mean she'll kill me for saying this but the, the, the thing that really struck us um which is true is the, she margaret and 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 the trust created this community of people mm. with yeah, which was what i experienced when i came along this huge um solidarity empathy um just a, a sense of uh a, I mean, I hesitate to use the word family and I've now used it and it's probably wrong, but you know, like a, it's a, a, anyway, a caring group that, very caring group. And um, with all its tensions and, um, and rivalries and, you know, <laughs> a lot of love as well, a huge amount of love. And that was what I experienced. And I thought that was an astonishing achievement, you know, that, um, that really was down to is down to Margaret and the work we did. So that was the kind of feeling we wanted to end on, yeah. really. And I think there has been a real inspiration for people watching. Um, there's been a lot of messages about the difference that you've made, Margaret, to people in their social work life. Um, people sharing your, um, your book, sharing your story, sharing your film, people who know you. And, um, a couple of comments that I did just want to share with you. One is, um, it's amazing how the reminders of why we do this, do social work, come right when you need them. And that watching the film has left me with a, um, a memory of a, a powerful memory of hope. And I wondered, Margaret, if you would kind of draw the evening to a bit of a close by um, any final message or any particular message you want to share to social workers. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's been, you know, such a moving evening, really. And thank you to everybody that's watched the film and the things they've said and the positive conversations we've had about social work. 
So I'd really enjoyed the evening and I was really apprehensive because to be judged by your peers is not, um, you know, not for the faint hearted. And so, but I think you've really said it, it's all about hope. And, um, and that sounds so washy really, it doesn't it? What, what does it mean? And it means different things to different people. Um, and particularly at this, you know, challenging time that we've all been through, this great equaliser that we've all been through this and we all know fear and we all know sadness and we've all seen terrible loss and grief around this. But I think what the child migrants teach us is that we've all got resilience and we have to find it and we have to find it within each other. And the social work community has to find that resilience within itself and be stronger and as I said at the outset we need a much stronger clearer value base I think and particularly with social justice issues and human rights we need a much stronger voice and I remember in the early days when we were challenging we were saying why did this happen and who are you and what are you going to do about it and I remember many comments, she's just a social worker. They underestimated you, Margaret. They underestimate our profession. Mm. Thank you so much, um, Jim and Margaret, for being with us tonight and for sharing your experiences and for allowing us to sp spend time with, with people who experienced, um, who, were f who were child migrants through through the stories, through the film. And uh, Margaret, before we started you, you, the, the evening, you said that few of us know um, these stories really who've met, you know, have met the people. Um, everyone who's, who's been here tonight has had the chance to, um, to learn and to hear those stories and to hold the remembrance of what we've seen and heard with us as we go off in our lives and off to do our, our different social work roles and to share that and not to forget it and to carry it on so thank you for giving us that opportunity and thank you to the child migrants trust particularly ian and pauline for all their help with arranging this and um, please remember everyone you can you can donate to the child migrant trust and thank you to basel heritage for making this possible and um for the producers who allowed us to screen the film and yeah, it just remains to, to wish you a very good night and thank you again for, for spending the time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank yeah. you. Bye, everybody. Take care. Cheers. Thanks a lot. <laughs>